This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, founded in 1979 by one Charlie Papazian, whose sage advice still resonates. Relax. Don't worry. Have a homebrew. Join Charlie and other beer enthusiasts at homebrewersassociation.org. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 12th, 2019. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby talks about hop breeding and genetics. How do hop breeders come up with all those tasty new varieties? And what the heck is a triploid anyway? If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you'd give us the favor or do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment there, they say that'll help new listeners to find us. And if you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. And uh, thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a, list, a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. The Patreon supporter group is growing, and I definitely appreciate everybody who's uh, supporting basic brewing efforts there. Um, losing that affiliate link to the uh, certain unfeeling online retailing giant was a big blow, but uh, a bunch of you stepped in and stepped up to uh, keep this train on the track, and I I definitely appreciate it. We also have to thank our friends and sponsors like Imperial Organic Yeast. The uh, pseudo sati that I brewed with Imperial's Kaviking blend is really tasty and fun. Uh, everybody I've talked to who's tried Imperial Organic Yeast gets excited about it. Imperial offers the highest cell count of any liquid yeast producer, 200 billion cells. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I stopped making starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. Uh, my airlocks are generally dancing before the sun goes down. It's incredible. Imperial is the only certified manufacturer of organic yeast in the world. They've got top-notch, friendly customer service, an industry-leading QC program, and you got to love the easy, open pouch. Casey from Imperial has uh, let me know of something special that they're going to release this fall, uh, which may happen before the end of the month, so keep your ears open. Uh, check out all the awesome Imperial strains at imperialyeast.com and pick up some at your friendly local homebrew store, Imperial Organic Yeast. And we certainly appreciate uh, the support that uh, Casey and everybody at Imperial uh, has given this program. Let's give a uh, quick look into the mailbag. Frank from Philly writes, big fan of the show. Thanks, Frank. And you've almost talked me into go, uh, giving up propane. <laughs> Uh, two temperature-slash-time-related questions about your Warthog 240-volt single-vessel system. Frank says, on average, how long does it take to heat up from tap to strike? And then how long does it take to heat up after from after sparge to boil? Well, thanks, Frank. Uh, wait, this suspiciously sounds more like a word from our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa rather than just being a strict uh, mailbag segment. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. It is a leg it's a legitimate question that I've, that I've gotten a couple times recently, so I thought I'd, I'd address it. Uh, as you know, I have the 240-volt, 10-gallon brew-in-a-bag system from High Gravity. And according to Dave, I haven't timed it myself, but Dave says if you have 8 gallons of water in the kettle, which is what I start out with for a 5-gallon batch, the 240-volt system will raise the heat of that 8 gallons at a rate of 4 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. And, of course, the 120-volt 5-gallon system is half that rate. Um, but Frank has another question. He says, if I wanted to, or if one wanted to, could you remove the electrical from the unit and use propane? Well, I don't know why you'd want to do that, unless maybe you're going camping, or maybe you're taking your uh, brew in a bag system uh, for a group brew somewhere without access to power. Uh, but Dave says you don't have to remove the electrical components. Since the brew in a bag system is based on a Cajun cooker, you can just put the kettle right there on the propane burner and use it that way in a pinch, of course. 
Uh, one caveat, Dave says you might want to shield the O-rings on the system. You know, make sure that you're taking care of them. But uh, let's say you get the 120-volt system from high gravity and want to speed up the time it takes to get to strike temperature. Well, you can put the Warthog brew in a bag system on the stovetop and use your burner to supplement the electric element. And then after you get up to a temperature, you can just use electricity to maintain the temp. Uh, and then go on to boil. So very flexible, and, and uh, you know, I love my Warthog system. But uh, one more thing about the folks at High Gravity, they're celebrating 15 years of being in business. This Saturday, September 14th, there'll be a party at 3 p.m. at Pippin's Tap Room there at High Gravity to celebrate. So congratulations to Desiree and Dave and everybody at HighGravityBrew.com for 15 years of being an awesome Homebrew shop, highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's talk to Chris Colby, editor of beerandwinejournal.com, about hop breeding and genetics. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. you got all kinds of stuff going on now. You've, you've written articles for two magazines re- recently that I know of and you've got you you've told me maybe in secret of some book things going on so you're you're a busy guy I am a busy guy that's a it's better than not being busy <laughs> in addition to raising monarch butterflies and uh, container gardening and cat wrangling and all that good stuff cat wrangling yeah yeah I uh I've had a uh, I've got an article, the one we're going to talk about today, in Craft Beer and Brewing, and uh, I've got two articles in a magazine that just premiered called uh, Fermentation Magazine. Oh. And I'm going to be uh, I'm slated to write even more articles for them, including some on uh, this this beverage called beer. <laughs> and where 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 might we uh, find these uh, these magazines these publications? Uh, at the magazine store, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they exist still. Uh, yeah, do they? I, I don't know. I, there, uh, there are buildings with books and magazines made of paper still. I don't know. Yeah, and newsstands everywhere. I'm guessing, or in your in your finer uh, uh, dentist offices and, and things like that. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Next to highlights, have you got anything coming out in highlights? Have, uh... I don't. <laughs> goofus, goofus and Gallant in the brew house. <laughs> goofus doesn't sanitize his equipment. <laughs> yeah. Gallant always checks that the, that the uh, valves are closed before adding boiling hot water to a vessel. <laughs> See, there's another yeah. book, another book idea. Yeah. So, so we're uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the article in Craft Beer and Brewing magazine, and what what do we got going on in this one? Um, it's a story about hop breeding. You know, uh, the basic idea that you know these days new hops are debuting all over the place, and uh, this is how do you know how do these come into being, both how and why. And it's kind of complicated with hops uh, because you've got your you got your male plants, you got your female plants, you got your diploid and your triploid, and you got your rhizomes, and you got your all this kind of stuff going on. Where it's it's kind of a different world from just normal or regular uh, like tomato breeding or something like that, right? Yeah, hop breeding is very interesting. Uh, I thought. Um... If you if you're breeding, you know a lot of other things like uh, if it's flowers or garden vegetables or whatever, you start with uh, varieties that breed true. Like if you if you've got a, a sort of a, I don't know a petunia, and it, it has a certain set of characteristics. If you take the seeds from that petunia and plant them, they'll grow up and they'll have you know in most cases with a bred you know commercially available variety, those those seeds will grow up. To have the uh, characteristics of it of the parent, uh, but and, and also you can, you know, if you had a greenhouse, you could probably do two generations of uh, 
two generations of that plant in a year and you know you, you could breed away and uh have a new new variety you know in in a, in a fairly short time potentially and uh the weird thing about hops though is that uh if you if you would take the seeds uh you know from a cascade plant let's say uh, a cascade plant is fertilized by a male plant and there are weirdly enough there's no male cascade plants on the planet uh <laughs> There's there's uh, male plants that are you know somewhere there's at least there's one with that's half cascade you know from whatever made the hybrid but uh, and maybe more some other places I don't know but you know there's no male cascade plant but if you planted the seeds you know from a cascade plant that had been fertilized and made seeds they wouldn't be cascade hops they would you know they might be similar in some ways or they might be very different because uh, they don't uh, hops don't breed true. They're like most plants, you know, like uh, the petunias or green beans or whatever. You know, they've been bred generation over generation to, you know, before they've been released commercially to, uh, you know, to breed true. That so that you can, you know, if you buy green beans and you harvest the beans for their seeds and you plant them, it's the same kind of green beans. But with hops, if you if you fertilize them, plant all the seeds. Uh, they're they're very uh, heterozygous in the uh, in the genetics lingo. They've you know for every gene they they're diploid, so they've got two copies of every gene. And in a lot of cases, the two genes are not uh, or the two different copies of the same gene, which would be alleles, are different. So they don't breed true. And and also you, in order to evaluate a hop from a cross, let's say you. Uh, and so you get a male plant, uh, you cross it to Cascade or, or, or any female, and you get all the seeds and you grow them up. If you're wondering, are, there, are any of these good at bre- brewing, you're not going to know for three years. You know, the first year, uh, they're, they're probably going to have, you know, no cones whatsoever. Uh, second year, maybe a few, but it's really the third year that they're going to yield enough. And then um, if you're, if the, you know, if you're good, going to attempt to grow these commercially uh the the hop has to work with the mechanical harvesters it has to work with the machinery that separates the cones from the uh you know the vines and uh you know so you need to grow out uh a test uh, a test plot that's at least big enough to fill the oast once the oast is the the little uh, oven, or not little oven, it's usually the size of a, a fairly large building, but uh, it's essentially an oven that, that dries the hops, and so you need to grow enough that it can go, you know, it can harvest uh, the cone separated from the rest of the plant material and dried, you know, you need one load of that, uh, you know, so the hops can then be evaluated. So, and that's several years, that's many, many years, because it's you know, after the third year, you've got probably got enough cones that you can start to you can go do the chemistry, and maybe even a you know a test brew or whatever. Uh, but you know, early on, the hops are evaluated for uh, largely their agronomic uh, properties. You know, do they do they grow? Are they drought resistant? Are they are they drought are resistant to you know? Uh, mildews and that sort of stuff so it's yeah it's really interesting because it's so in a lot of ways so different from uh you know quote unquote ordinary plant breeding and what you once you get the a a hop that you think that will work uh you know in the agricultural and in cultivating sense you you've got to market it to brewers if you go out you go to all that work and the brewers don't like the characteristics of those hops you know, then all that that work in breeding is uh, is wasted. So I'm assuming they do like little small batches, uh, you know, with these hops as they're they're you know kind of fostering them along to see if there's any interest before they they go real big on these things. Yeah, you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't go all in the hop with, without some idea of it having you know useful brewing uh, properties. But early on, a lot of the uh, a lot of the evaluation is for uh, how does it grow, what's it resistant to, what's the yield, uh, and especially alpha levels. Uh, 
so you know the the chemical analysis plays a big uh, role along with uh, you know what the farmers say, and then um, you know on top of that, like you say, uh, nobody's you know if it's a um, if it's a hop variety that smells like rotting fish, you know <laughs> does, does, doesn't matter if it grows great and, and the machine you know it's easy to machine harvest you know, no one's gonna. No one's going to buy that hop. That's a callback to your article in the other magazine about the uh, rotting fish. Yeah, the fermenting uh, fish. But that's another that's another podcast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I you somehow s- can't get that out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I can't seem to forget you. Your rotting yeah. fish stays on my mind. I uh, so so you know we we're, we do this little thing we call the hop sampler Steve and I and and we read these uh, descriptions of the of the hops and they say they're a cross between this this uh, b- you know variety and that variety or you know variety A and variety B but you say there's no, like no male cascade uh, right. or there's no male whatever variety that's out there so how can they how can they cross those those uh, two hop strains. If there's no, if there's no male for the uh, for a lot of the older, you know, the noble hops and stuff, the the land race hops, there are you know males and females out there. Uh, but for the newer ones, they were created uh, by uh, you know hybridization, make, taking uh, uh, you know generally a, a brewing strain, taking a female. And then mating it with it with another male, and uh, a lot of times I think also if you look at the descriptions, they'll say they won't say necessarily a, a male, you know, Galena. They'll say a male with Galena in its heritage or something. Um, you know, I'd, I'd have to look at the exact cross to know which, uh, you know, which is which. But there are, you know, in the old. Land race hops. There are, if I'm, if I remember correctly, there are males. And those are in uh, on the hop production fields. Those are verboten. Those are kept far away from the <laughs> from all the rest of the females, right? All the rest of the girls. Yeah, they don't they don't grow male hops anywhere near uh, uh, the uh, uh, production growth of, of hops because they uh, if the if the female plants are uh, fertilized by male pollen, the uh, the cones have seeds, which is uh, uh, it takes away from the brewing quality of the uh, of the hops. So if you're if you've got a like a like a female cascade and you've got some rogue wild land race male hop, you know, within the neighborhood, uh, and some pollen gets on the uh, onto the cones of the uh, the cascade, it doesn't change that hop cone. It's still a cascade cone, right? It doesn't change it into the hybrid on that first generation. Yeah, the uh, the pollen would if it uh, if it affects the female plant, the pollen would go to the flower of the uh, female plant, and then it would grow a cone. And you know that's a good question. Uh, I th- I think it would still be the the cone of the female, but it would be it would have seeds, so it would be uh, less uh, less useful in brewing. But then, the, but it would be the seeds that would have the characteristics of the hybrid between the cascade female and that rogue uh, male in the neighborhood, right? I mean, if you right. planted those yeah. seeds, then you would have the hybridization afterwards. Um, yes. If I'm remembering my high school advanced bio, I, I, got, I made it all the way to advanced biology in high school. I know everything about this stuff, but what oh. what I <laughs> what I, I dissected stuff. But what I, what I don't understand, you know, is you have the diploid and then you have the triploid. What's the you know we read that in the descriptions of these hops. What what do those two terms mean, and and how do they work? Uh. Hops are ordinarily diploid, meaning that they have two copies of of every gene. They have one they inherit from their mother and one they inherit from their father. Um, there are certain strains that are triploid 
that due to hybridization, um, uh, you know, and it's a uh, sometimes this is induced. I, I think in various different ways, uh, but you can you can trick a plant into uh, either the female donating both sets of her uh, uh, chromosomes and then adding the male to get a third triploid, and or or the converse. Um, and so anyway, and, and also given that the hops aren't propagated by breeding, like normally triploids, uh, although plants are tricky, they sometimes triploids can breed, but normally, or I, normally is not the right word there. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you uh, if you bred a triploid from you know uh, a diploid species, it wouldn't it wouldn't breed well. Uh, but in some cases it would, but in the case of hops, it doesn't matter since once, once you have the growing plant, it's propagated by, uh, cutting the rhizomes and cloning it. It's essentially the mule of the hop, (laughs) of the hop world. (laughs) Mules can't, uh, mules are across, but they can't breed. A little bit like that. That's imagine you could cut up a mule into a bunch of little pieces and each little piece (laughs) grew into a mule. Don't try that at home. <laughs> yeah, don't, I, that doesn't work. You get a visit from your animal control officer. <laughs> and I and I don't think I, 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 mules are probably not triploid in their uh, genetic uh, composition. Uh, no, I don't. I can't remember the genetics. They're just uh, they're just a hybrid that doesn't produce viable. Uh, would would that be kind of like the things. be kind of like people who are who have the XXY? Situation? Would they be triploid? I'm getting into stuff that probably doesn't matter, but <laughs> just curious. Uh, they're not overall triploid for for that chromosome. They would be the the sex chromosome, but uh, like a triploid. Uh, I mean, uh, they don't occur in humans because they would it would not have any viability whatsoever. But uh, yeah, triploid would be have uh, three complete sets of all its chromosomes. And then Neil Pert, I think, is a YYZ uh, chromosome. <laughs> YYZ. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <Da-na-na-na. laughs> I'm triggering a lot of people out there. So, uh, <laughs> so when you get a when you get a a rhizome, you what you get if you want to grow hops at home is a rhizome or sort of a root uh, uh, component of the plant, and that is a cutting. From a cutting, from a cutting, from a cutting, from a cutting, probably of the original uh, cultivar, the original variety that was created uh, or bred in the field, right? You've got a you've got a clone in your on your hands. Yeah, if you, uh, especially if you're buying a, a type of hop rhizome from something that's been around for a while, your many uh, quote unquote generations of uh, propagation. It's not really a generation because it's not a new uh, organism. But yeah, uh, yeah, you're just buying a clone of a plant. I mean, it's interesting if you go, if you go to a commercial hop uh, field, you know, and they're huge, you can be standing in a line, you know, in a row and you can look almost to the, you know, uh, horizon and there's hop plants going one way and there's hop plants going the other way. Those are all the same plant. They, there was at some point uh, uh, there was a male and a female that came together. There was a seed that grew up, and you know if you're in a cascade plant in a cascade field, every one of those cascade plants was cloned from you know the original uh, cascade plant. Much like the what was that the army in uh, Star Wars being cloned from Boba Fett. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I, is, is that one of the prequels? I, don't, I wasn't into the prequels. That's uh, yeah. I'm a purist. Wasn't it? It was one of the yeah. It was one of the first three movies. I think. <laughs> now you're into geekdom that even I don't know about. There you go. So, so I see posts every now and then on Twitter of some somebody posts a picture on there and says, "Well, looks like I got a male hop plant." Uh, so what are the odds that somebody who bought a, a, a commercial rhizome 
actually got a male hop plant? Zero percent. Yeah, they don't. No, no place is going to sell you a male rhizome. So what's going on? What? If somebody show, gets a picture on there and there's a, there, you see a hop vine, uh, and there's no, uh, there's no cones on it. What, what, what's up? Well, if it's a first year plant, uh, that's just par for the course. You you grow it the first year, and there, if there's any cones on it at all, you're lucky. Um, second year, uh, you will probably get some cones, but it, it's sparse. It's not really till the third year that the plant starts yielding uh, cones. And also, I, I had a discussion with um, uh, oh, and I'm not going to remember any any names, but on a past show. Uh, I was told by a hop uh, grower that hops like to be grown tall, and they and they really don't put on cones unless they are put up a trellis and they are grown tall. Uh, my uh, you know my my compost heap hops that I'd like to talk about a lot. Uh, hmm. You know when I when I didn't have them on a, a trellis of any kind, I just had them as kind of a shrub because I didn't know what that guy was doing. They never produced any coin. In like three years, they grew there, and they never produced a single cone. So I threw them in the compost heap, and they grew. They're 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 very happy there now. You know, a decade later, uh, but even now they're growing on a chain link fence. Which so there's a lot of vegetation, and they're growing horizontally. But even then, there's a ton of vegetation, and there's only just a handful of cones. Uh, so I, I next I keep thinking that I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to actually put a string up to a tree or something and let these things grow upwards and see what happens. But I think unless you let your hops grow way tall, they're not going to give you the kind of conage uh, that you want. And so you may be tricked into thinking that you got you know some kind of male uh, hop plant. That's possible too. Also, uh, most hop varieties. Uh, the, the cone density is uh, on the trellis is highest at the top. And one of the things um, when I was talking to the, uh, some hop breeders for this article is one of the things they, they, they breed for, would, you know, another one of the, the, the growing characteristics is that hops, they want to get hops all the way up and down the, uh, you know, the, the vine is like 30 feet tall. And, and you know, they want hops coming out of, you know, out of all of it, not just the top ten feet, and so that's uh, yet another character that they uh, that they uh, try to select for. And and it's and it's bind with a B as in boy, not not vine with a V as in Victor, right? Technically, right? Yeah, I mean it's a vine with a V, but the kind of vine it is is a bind with a B. Yeah, so it's not. It's not wrong. It would be like calling, uh, you know, a VW Beetle a, a car. You know, it is a car, but <laughs> you, you can be more specific and say it's, you know, VW Bug. Uh, <laughs> if you want to be called out on uh, on Twitter, uh, call it a, call it a vine. So, did, so in talking to these breeders, what's what's coming up? What's new? Do you have? Did you get any in, inside information on what, uh, you know, what trends are out there as far as you know what are in the testing fields? I didn't get any specific information like you know this new variety is coming out or whatever but i mean uh i mean brewers should just know that there's you know there's always stuff in the pipeline you know the fact that something came out last year meant that you know eight or ten years ago or 12 years ago somebody started that you know that that ball rolling and every year you know someone starts the, the ball rolling now so there's a lot there's a lot of stuff in progress. I talked to them about, uh, GMOs. Mm. I'm like, like, is anyone going to go down that road? And, and right now I guess the, uh, they feel that consumers would reject those out of hand. So there's, there's no real, uh, work being done on that. Which, uh, and yeah, I did, I didn't press them on, you know, uh, anything about specific strains coming out because, you know, we'll we'll find out in time. So, what's the difference between a a genetically modified hop and a just a a, a hop that has been bred, uh, you know, to favor different genetic uh, characteristics? Uh, not much, except for the technique. I mean, in the case of a, a hop that's been bred the traditional way, you would take 
you know, say a, a female hop that has brewing characteristics that you like, you would take a male hop that has some sort of growing characteristic that you like, like, you know, for example, let's say you, you've got a, a brewing variety that's uh, that's well liked, but it's uh, <clears throat> it's vulnerable to mildew. You would uh, find a male that has mildew resistant genes, and you would you would breed those two, and then you would you would grow up all the hops looking for ones that had good brewing potential, but also had you know hopefully as much as much of the original. Uh, you know, play characteristics of the brewing hop with, but also were mildew resistant. You know, uh, in the case of a GMO, you would just take the original hop, you would cut out the gene. If there were, if you could find, you know, if it was a single gene that conferred mildew resistance, you just cut the gene out, move it into the, the plant and be done with it. You know, it would, it would save you like, uh, well, it's weird because in normal plant, plant brewing, what you would do is you would, you know, do the original cross and then you would, you would do a series of back crosses where you took the mildew resistance, you know, the mil mildew resistant offspring and, and cross it back to the original plant over and over and over until it, essentially you had the genetics, but the, uh, the mildew resistance genetics in it. Uh, so... The GMO just skips all those generations of brewing and just moves the gene over directly. Hmm. And in the case of in the case of hop breeding, though, though they don't do the back crosses. The uh, they, the hops are all uh, hybrids of hybrids of hybrids of hybrids, and they're, they're very heterozygous. And so there's, uh, you know, and given that it would take, you know, multiple years for each back cross, they you know just nobody's gonna. Nobody's going to do that. One trend that I, that uh, I'm interested in is hops being grown outside the traditional latitude. Uh, you know that uh, that people generally grow hops. Uh, like for instance, there I saw one of the local brewers here in Northwest Arkansas post that uh, there's a, a hop farm over in Oklahoma. That is, uh, you know, growing some hops, and uh, you know, the brewery said, "Look, look for some, you know, local hops uh, in uh, in a beer, you know, at the end of the season or whatever." So, I'm interested to see how productive these hop farms are, you know, outside of the of the uh, traditional latitude that hops are comfortable growing in. Yeah, I grew hops uh, for several years. Um, and I found even where I am in, uh, you know, central southern Texas, uh, the sort of American hops, you know, Cascade Centennial and all that grew pretty well. The uh, uh, noble hops, not so much. Uh, they, they grew well, but they were uh, the flavor was just insanely grassy mm. from them. And I worked a couple years. I started getting the idea that um, – because commercial growers, uh, they let the hops grow for a little while, then they cut them back uh, a couple weeks after they've sprouted, and then you know they, they grow full to their full uh, height. And they know, given you know given the variety, they know when they're going to come uh, uh, do you know they're they're, they're going to be ripened. And I, I had worked with letting the, the hops grow tall and then cutting them way back and letting them re-sprout with the idea that instead of, because around here the, the hops can be finished by like July, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the hottest time of the year, trying to force the hops to, to mature, you know, in at least September when the temperatures come down a little bit or even later than that. Uh, and then we had the giant uh, drought of 2011, which uh, uh, killed all my hops and I was just, yeah, screw it. <laughs> Yeah, my Cascade hops did pretty well, and they looked they looked nice. They had a bunch of cones on them, and I thought, man, those are really good looking hops. And then I went to a, a commercial uh, hop growing facility, you know, up in Oregon, and uh, that yeah, was no comparison. <laughs> it was just I was just blown away. It was like Land of the Giants or something. <laughs> the size of these 
these uh, hop trellises and hop vines and the you know it's like uh, cones as big as your fists my man you know they were just it was just ridiculous uh so yeah it's uh, yeah it, it does make a difference it's yeah it's interesting and it, you know it's, it's it's nice that there are breweries who are, who are trying to grow that and, and a local thing but on the on the other hand there's a you know there's a reason why the hop growing regions uh you know cluster along the latitudes that they do so you know i mean with some if you had someone who was both a brewer and a good plant breeder and they had a couple hundred years to to really work work on some varieties uh that are are more heat resistant and to work on the the way that they're handled then that'd be cool yeah well i'm you know i'm not going to count them out i I say good luck to them and uh, i will rejoice in their success if it happens also, if you had a big enough greenhouse that you could control the light and the heat for, you could set it, you know, you could program it, hypothetically, if you had the, the equipment, to do the, you know, go through the growing season anywhere on Earth. I, I thought about this a couple of years ago when um, I was thinking about, you know, if you had the, if you had the rainfall and the temperatures and all that records from like the most famous uh, vintages of wine, mm. you know, you could just recreate that in a, in a, a, and then of course you need the same, same vines, but you can recreate that in a greenhouse and uh, waste a, a lot of money. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, you know, thanks to recent legislation in both uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas, if people did have those kinds of facilities, they wouldn't be growing hops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They'd be growing a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> a closely related plant, yes. <laughs> you know, and cheers to them, too. So there you go. Well, Chris, it's been fun again, and uh, and and this will be out in in uh, or it is out in Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, and the, your your uh, article on uh, fermentation in general is in the magazine called Fermentation. Is that right? Yeah, it's just called Fermentation. Yeah, the the Craft Beer and Brewing is the uh, August September issue, which is their their IPA focused issue. So. I don't know if uh, do people drink IPAs anymore? Is that still a thing? Uh, that's nobody drinks those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all pilsners now. So, uh, people yeah, are like pilsners, to, but you know. I know, but you go into a bar and they'll have seven taps, and like six of them will be IPA. And, oh, great! <laughs> I'll have one of those. Oh, uh, all right. I don't have a choice. I'll have one of those. Well, thank goodness I like them. All righty. Well, I appreciate it, and we will uh, we will be keeping tabs on your progress on all your uh, projects. Okie dokie. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks again to Chris. Looking forward to reading what he's working on. He's got some projects coming up. Uh, in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop, online shop, at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dutson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.